Hello, and welcome to Heart Senses The Pulse, where we focus on conversations in cardiovascular care. In recognition of Women's History Month, we are proud to focus on women's cardiovascular care and research. And I am joined today by our special guest, Dr. Courtney Jordan Beckler. Dr. Jordan Beckler is the Medical Director of Health Equity and Health Promotion at Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation and is a preventative integrative cardiologist. Dr. Jordan Beckler, welcome and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here, Sabrina. Great. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to talking about women in cardiovascular research. I have recently discovered that we are pretty underrepresented in clinical trials and in research, yet there are is quite a large percentage of women that have a heart disease or die of a heart attack or stroke. So this is a really interesting topic to focus on today. Absolutely. And we can't have better outcomes, right, without including the right population into the studies themselves. So it's a critical area for sure. Yes. Okay. I would love to just start with a stat that according to the American Heart Association, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in women killing one woman about every 80 seconds. And to also note that women have biological differences between, you know, versus men. And so this is why research should really reflect those differences. Um, Yeah, it's a critical, it's a critical area. So um, heart disease is the leading killer of women. Um, And in fact, what we're seeing in in studies now and in our prevalence data is that while we're seeing heart disease outcomes improving for men, we're not seeing them improving at the same rate for women. And in particular, in the demographic for women ages 35 to 45, we're seeing heart attacks actually going up. And so this area um, around the time right before menopause, during and after is really critical, as you mentioned, in part because of hormone differences that can be protective um, pre-menopause. And then also we see oftentimes with pregnancy, it's our first stress test as women. Oh, okay. Yes. And so there's a huge opportunity to understand what's happening with women's bodies during that time and then making sure if there was something identified, gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, or you know, high blood sugar or blood pressure that develops in pregnancy, preeclampsia, or even heart failure, are these women then getting their risk reduced afterwards, which is some of the areas that we're studying right now, because what we're finding is they are not. And this is, in fact, our first warning sign that we should be um, treating and looking at women differently. Oh, wow. That is really interesting. So what really sparked your individual interest in focusing on women's cardiovascular research? Yeah. So I um, became really interested in both cardiac um, in the first place, because there's so much opportunity to have impact to, you know, um, to have second chances for people to ideally avoid it from ever happening in the first place. But, um, you know, women only represent 12% of all cardiologists in the country. And so uh, as a female cardiologist, it really then interests me to look at these gaps that we have and figure out both the connection biologically, but then also sociologically, because I think a lot of our trial design is really designed for men who have someone stay at home and help organize their appointments and get them enrolled in trials and bring them to these appointments. And for most of us women, we are balancing many things in life, careers, families, parents, children, Um, And how do we best make sure that trials are designed and inclusive in ways that really meet the needs of women differently? And I think being a female ourselves, um, it's helpful to lend that that eye toward that. Yes. And are you um, with a team of all female research researchers for this um, particular interest? 
So we have a mixed team and I should be clear in that. I absolutely think men can be and are our allies in this situation, but I think it's helpful to at least have a 50% representation, if not more, since we are 50% of the population and we're often not 50% of the research participants or the researchers. So we have a very mixed team. Um, it does tend probably a, a little higher female in number, but we definitely have men as a part of it as well. Well, that's great to have that mixed variety and to better analyze research outcomes using both um, the expertise of all different cardiologists of different walks of life. Oh, it's going to so, take everything. Yeah, it takes a village. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so um, the underrepresentation is just astronomical, really, from what I've been seeing, that percentage. And um, it's just fascinating because 60 million women, so 45% of women in the U.S. are living with some form of heart disease. Mm -hmm. And so on that note, why is it so important to analyze women's health outcomes versus men's health outcomes, particularly with heart disease and cardiovascular care? Yeah, because unfortunately right now what we see is not only are women underrepresented in trials, but then when we look at heart outcomes like you're talking about, women are less likely to get appropriate treatment. And right now they're more likely to have an adverse outcome in terms of um, they're more likely to die. They're less likely to get bypass surgery. They're less likely to get an angiogram if they're having chest pain than a man. And so all these different things that ultimately are the outcomes um, that are critical that we're looking at how are our moms, sisters, daughters, nieces, aunts, whatever you want to say, doing in these trials. Yeah. And so what what are they being... Um... Me not misdiagnosed. Okay, let me think of the right term. <laughs> what are they experiencing then, these women that are then not going through treatment early enough for the preventative side of um, their cardiovascular care? So number one, your word was right, misdiagnosed. There's actually a whole documentary called Misdiagnosed on Women's Heart Disease. So one, women are getting misdiagnosed. It's not uncommon that women are seen and told they have anxiety when they're experiencing palpitations and having a fit. This is something that we, you know, unfortunately have, have seen. Then, um, unfortunately, we are not getting disease detected early. We're not getting treatment early. And Again, I think this speaks to sometimes this, we have to put our oxygen mask on first. I think many of us tend to be concerned about others and other, um, other competing interests and um, sometimes put our health last. And then we also are not often the prioritized um, part of research. And so it's kind of a both and of we as the user need to make sure we're making sure that we're getting the right treatment and detection, but then we as the clinicians and researchers need to make sure that we can't be having new trials, new new devices that don't have at least 50% women represented and then have equal representation of racial and ethnic minorities that if you look at the studies, unfortunately, women of color do worse um, in these outcomes. Yes. And so you mentioned that um, you're, well, you're thinking of clinical trials moving forward, you're trying to have 50% be represented as women. But are there other ways that you and your team are trying to improve participation for women? Absolutely. So one of the big things that we're trying to do is go to where women are. So right now, for instance, um, we are doing what we call the fourth trimester um, work. So this is the period after pregnancy that I was just talking to you about um, where did we actually reduce risk factors that we saw develop in pregnancy? So we looked at our own database, saw that we didn't do a good job of this, that we have a lot of work to do. So we're bringing a virtual option out partnering with um, a new leader in healthcare, uh, nice healthcare that goes to your home, goes to your office. You can do it all virtually has, again, taken care of some of these 
barriers of entry Mm -hmm. um, to make it easier for women to get what they need in terms of treatment earlier and where they want it. Wow, that is fantastic. And especially thinking about this partnership um, to really make it more accessible uh, and specifically for women with our health. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that is, yeah, that's really wonderful. And on the whole um, concept of Women and Women's History Month, I would love to just ask a couple of questions about your experience as a woman in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first question is, um, was there a woman that was your mentor or inspired you to go into healthcare? And then the secondary is to that you went into cardiology. Was there also a female mentor for that? Yeah, so I'll start with the first one. And um, I think it's kind of interesting along the lines we're saying, because actually, the main person that inspired me to go into medicine was my eighth grade male science teacher. But um, so interesting in my mind, because this was an accelerated um, science class. And you often hear how women or girls are told that they're not as good at math and science as boys. And this, I'll never forget, Mr. Sadoff. Um, so we, um, every test that we took, he would announce who had the highest score on the test, a boy or a girl, eighth grade student. And it made me realize objectively that we were doing just as well as the boys were. And we would race into this class. They would, um, whoever got there first would write, you know, women rule on the board and then the the, kid, the boys would come in and they'd erase the, the WO. And it was this very healthy competition where whatever noise there might have been, you know, I don't remember this noise, but the noises that you hear of, of like girls thinking they can't succeed in these fields um, mm-hmm. was very quickly squashed because I knew we were doing just as well. Um, so, and it was in that nobody in my family is in medicine or science that we had exposure. We had like once a month exposures to things you could do. And that was when I first was like, I'm going to, I, there, a doctor came in. I said, that's exactly what I want to do. And it really was from there on and that I wanted to, to decided I was going to be a doctor. And I was in that class with three other women that were, you know, part of this particular crew and bunch of engineers, you know, and I just, I think about it all the time that we all ended up doing things in science and what a huge part this teacher was who happened to be a man in this case. So that, you know, I think to the piece of having allies in this, um, that help push you along, um, is, is really great. Which, by the way, I would say of your leader, um, Dr. Keller has definitely been um, such a, an advocate and help um, in this field to me as well. So, yes, that's wonderful. I know that you and Dr. Keller work together with the Kappa Alpha Psi program and their Heart Health Initiative, and just are inspiring people across the U.S. to really focus on their heart health and to tell their family members that they need to also be aware. So. Yeah. Yeah. And so what um, was the inspiration for you to get into cardiology? You know, and I think to what you're saying that way, um, two things. One, I loved that within cardiology, you could have primary prevention, secondary detection, tertiary. There were so many different places. And I love the primary and secondary prevention, what we can do early. But I also love that you can help someone die with dignity that has advanced heart failure, you can really be there for the whole trajectory. Mm -hmm. But um, I will say specifically to female mentors, I had um, three, actually, um, yeah, three, three female mentors at the time that I was at the University of Minnesota, all of whom um, were black female cardiologists. And again, I just think some of this noise you hear of who can and can't do these things. It was really great um, to have that that much exposure um, because as I was saying to you before, 12% of women are, 12% of the cardiologists that we have are women. And so it was really great to to see that and see women doing all sorts of type of researchers and um, leading clinical trials and um, just having great 
great career. So, wow. So, have you always been local to the area then? Yes, unfortunately. In fact, one of those women said, the only problem with your resume, Courtney, is that you're always in Minnesota. And I, <laughs> every step of the way, tried to leave and um, look at particularly the coast, the east and west coast, and my family's all here. And so, and, and you know, now kids here. So I, I seem to be stuck for now or, or choosing, <laughs> choosing to stay for now is maybe a, the better way to say it. Yeah. And then at the same time, you're also inspiring and changing the health of your community members that, you know, you've grown up with and it's a generational thing. And so I think it's it's so important to say in a hometown, I haven't done it myself. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I hear you. Well, we have lots of work to do in Minnesota. So yeah. Yeah. And, um, so thinking about Women's History Month, and yesterday we celebrated International Women's Day, um, which I think it's a really fantastic opportunity for us to all kind of reflect, even for ourselves, um, like all of the different successes that we've had and things that we've learned from our past to help us become the women that we are now. Yeah. Um, and so why do you think it's important to acknowledge Women's History Month? Such a great question. Um, you know, the biggest thing I've been reflecting on this a lot lately with history is that we have to acknowledge the past, um, be aware of the past, know the past to make sure that we uh, don't repeat the past and in a, and continue to move positive change forward. So I think that's so important. You know, as you were saying, women weren't really largely allowed to participate in many trials until the 90s. I mean, this is not long ago. It hasn't been, you know, that long that we've been able to vote. It hasn't been that long that we've had female physicians, you know, it, it um, all these different female CEOs and entrepreneurs and all these different things that are happening. Um, so I think keeping that um, in mind to make sure um, as different changes get proposed and thinking about uh, the consequences of these types of things is really critical. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jordan Beckler, for your time today and for sharing your story with us about what it means to be a woman in healthcare and how we can pave the way forward for women in the future with cardiovascular research. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. As always, it's great to talk to you, Sabrina. Yes. Thank you so much.